Hey, what's going on everybody? Justin here and in this video I want to share six of my favorite science-ish works that I've read so far in 2024. I say ish because normally I've read enough to kind of do nature writing or environmental writing on one side and the more like sciences and you know biology books on the other. Well, didn't really read enough of like either of them I don't think to kind of disentangle those a bit and separate the threads but um, I got three honorable mentions and three that I want to get to uh, as like kind of my favorites as well. Um, I have done my 2024 favorite 2024 <laughs> releases as well. Uh, I'll put a link up there and down below if that's more your thing. But let's just go ahead and get started with some honorable mentions. So first up, I have Lab Girl by Hope Jaren. Um, this was fantastic. A lot of people love it, and I do as well. Um, I've read her story of more uh, quite a while ago, um, which is kind of her like. Um, kind of book on climate change and just over consumption and everything like that whereas this is sort of a biography an autobiography of her life uh, you kind of get uh, you kind of get invested in all the different i want to say atypical relationships that she has uh, both with like family and friends and everything uh, just kind of over the course of her life as she kind of goes through school then graduate school um, then running her own like laboratories, uh, which she's run several um, over the course of the years. And you kind of just feel like all oh, the stress and anxiety in the sense of, you know, how do you get funding and you're trying to provide for like, you know, your uh, lab assistants and things like that. You're trying to get all the stuff done, but you got to do all these proposals. You got to be efficient. You got to. I don't know, it's, it's, it is definitely like pull yourself up by your bootstraps kind of stuff. All the different kind of struggles she encountered um, with different things kind of in the world of academia uh, and universities and stuff like that. Um, just a really powerful book. I would definitely classify this more like on like kind of the biography memoir kind of style of book rather than like the hard sciences per se. There definitely is science sections um, when she's talking about like some of the research that she does, why she thinks it's important and kind of like, you know, how do you actually run a laboratory, which I actually found uh, really interesting like how one actually does that all the logistics behind it everything like that uh, but highly enjoyable if you haven't checked this one out you definitely should give it a try okay so for another honorable mention i have exercised why something we never evolved to do is healthy and rewarding by daniel lieberman and this is one i kind of wish i'd read um like in physical book format rather than an audiobook uh just because there's so much good stuff and this the whole premise of this book is you know, technically our ancestors really didn't like exercise, right? They didn't go to Pilates class. They didn't go lift up heavy circle, circles and stuff, you know, four times a week for an hour or whatever it is. Um, but they got along just fine. So like, you know, we didn't evolve to exercise and he kind of goes in kind of the psychology and physiology of why it's just kind of uncomfortable and kind of weird a lot, like, especially when you're first starting out and stuff. It's not like, a, it is not a natural thing for us to like, want to do per se um, but he definitely goes into you know the differences between like you know our sedentary lifestyles for the most part um and the lifestyles of different cultures around the world as well as probably like what our um former ancestors probably had for lifestyles and stuff and how you know they obviously didn't need to exercise because that wasn't really a priority because they were already doing like most of this stuff just to like survive and things like that. Um, so I, I definitely enjoyed kind of the blending of sociology, anthropology, you know, physiology and exercise science and everything. Um, there's actually quite a bit of that in there too. And it kind of goes around like different uh, places around the world uh, who are trying to like alleviate the problem, whether it's like in Scandinavia, some companies are basically <laughs> making the employees do like mandatory exercise trainings like in the middle of the day and stuff like that uh just uh really interesting stuff like that and um he actually uh goes out and you know outruns a horse and i i thought that was like a joke um and i looked that up and that's that's the thing like you know we can actually out humans that are in like decent physical condition can usually like outrun like marathon wise um uh, a horse and like fairly quick travel so i thought that was really cool uh, stuff like that, but I really enjoyed it. Like I said, I kind of wish I had the physical copy. I think I would have picked up a little bit more um, But be as it may, I'm really enjoyed. I listened to it and then lastly for uh, Honorable mentions we have Atul Gawande's being mortal what uh, medicine and what matters in the end and this is out of like the six books This is probably actually the best book. I'm just putting in the honorable mention because it's only kind of like tangentially science related uh, dealing with like medicine and um, you know, end of life services and things like that. Um, but there is some biology, some, uh, like I said, medicine kind of involved in there as well. 
But yeah, just terrific book. I wish I had read this when it came out. Like, I'd heard of it, and I just was like, ah, oh, this is like overhyped nonsense or something. And it's not. This is like definitely one of my best books that I've read so far this year. Like I said, I wish I'd read it earlier. Um, just the care and the just the style of his writing is so good. Um, a lot of his anecdotes that he puts in, like some of the different um, uh, elderly homes and retirement centers and stuff that he talks about, how some of them have failed, and then some of the changes some of them are doing, some different initiatives, especially the one with all the animals and stuff. Like, I just can't get over like how good this is. Um, and then he's even dealing with like his own personal like loss, uh, with the loss of his father over the kind of the course of the second half of the book and stuff, and how he's trying to put kind of his advice and you know, practices into practice, um, and how difficult it is sometimes, but how, uh, doctors and stuff can handle things a little bit better and differently and things like that, just to make everything better for everyone. You know, you want it to be a win, win, win for, you know, the patient, uh, having them have like the best like life possible rather than just extending, you know, a couple extra months or a couple extra years, even if it, or why would you do that if it's just going to be like terrible and suffering the entire time? They also want to win for the family members, um, so they have to, like, you know, they're able to process kind of like what's going on and things like that. So, anyways, really, really enjoyed it, and it's only an honorable mention because it's not like really sciencey, sciencey <laughs> per se. All right, so now let's go on to like my three kind of favorite actual like science works uh, so far. Uh, let's just start with the audiobook. These aren't going to be in any particular order. Uh, we have "What Do Bees Think About" by Mathieu Lioro. And oh shoot, oh, it's translated from the French. I can't remember who it was. I said it in the other video, but I didn't write it down. Anyways, it'll be like right there. Uh, anyways, this is uh, one of my favorite bee books that I've ever read, uh, and it came out earlier this year. Uh, just it's the what I think did it for me was his style of writing. Um, it's just even though it was translated, it almost didn't really feel like it was translated. Um, it just reads so well. And you kind of just hear about all a bunch of different experiments how uh, people have been doing with bees. You get a lot of the natural history, the ecology of bees. Um, you know, how do they function? But the big premise of this book is, you know, how do their brains operate? How do they actually go about processing information? Um, and how does that allow them to do what they're able to do? Such as, you know, uh, finding flowers, you know, hundreds of meters away from the hive. Um, being able to find their way back to the hive, you know, if it's like out of eyesight and stuff or out of vision, I should say. And then, you know, how do you communicate it through the different dances and things to your hive mates? So just stuff like that. Um, I just found it really fascinating. Like I said, I've read, I want to say, I should, I should have, I should do a video. <laughs> a couple of people actually kind of like vaguely asked for it. Um, like maybe I will do a video on like all the bee books that I've read so far. And this one is definitely up there um, as far as like one, just like kind of regular like science books that you read through. Um, though I do have some bee books that um, have a lot of like, you know, pictures and uh, illustrations and stuff that kind of add to the effect I think um, a lot of times but like I said uh, as far as like kind of just a, a hist like a I don't know like I said this is all about like contemporary research too so I think that I think that was part partially why it was like so good um but yeah and there's a Paul I, th I think it's like my third bee book I've read uh the bee and natural history from Princeton and then I also read uh, our native bees i can't remember who that one was by earlier this year as well and that one's actually pretty good too that was just dealing with all the like american bees that aren't the honey honey bee basically um but anyways like i said if you enjoy reading about bees if you enjoy reading about bugs or if you want to learn about bees you know and you're interested in them this is actually probably a great place to start all right so now I don't, I don't know why I've been holding that the entire time. Let's just go on to the next one here. And we have Dale Greenwald's Remnants of Ancient Life, The New Science of Old Fossils. And this is kind of another one, kind of similar to the last one, and that's all about contemporary research. Not necessarily new fossils per se, but different ways to approach um, and utilize the fossils uh, based on different methodologies and stuff that we have now. Um, but you're eight, you're eight, for example, the whole premise of the book is dealing with biomolecules. Um, so different, like kind of organic molecules that fossils still contain. Um, he definitely goes into like, you know, the whole DNA argument, <laughs> like Jurassic Park and all that kind of stuff. What can we actually extract for DNA and does it actually preserve that well and stuff? So I'll let you read that to find that out. Um, but you get a lot of like different things, uh, like different proteins, um, different things like chitin, different, uh, bio metals that insects use to like harden their mandibles, uh, all kinds of stuff, uh, different pigments and coloration, uh, between leaves. 
you know, dinosaurs, uh, different reptiles, things like that. You learn all kinds of cool stuff, but I really enjoyed how the book dealt a lot with, you know, here's like the new method, you know, whatever, whatever it is. And this is how we're going to like start using how we have like this fossil we have, and we're going to start using it uh, on this fossil to try to figure out something new, even though we've had this fossil for, for quite some time. So I just found that, found that really interesting. Um, and I did like, um, how he went to a lot of the different archeological sites. Um, he, you know, he runs like one himself in the middle of nowhere as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. But how, like, you know, the different, uh, I guess, ways of going about doing like, uh, paleontology and stuff is, I don't know. I just found it really good. Like kind of like down to earth. Um, just like kind of like real life. This is, you know, how we do it. This is how we get a fossil. This is how we're going to like, you know, put it in the laboratory, what lasers we're going to shoot at it or whatever it is, uh, things like that. And like look inside it and get some new information out of it. So I, I really enjoyed it. And then lastly, we have Thor Hansen's Hurricane Lizards and Plastic Squid, The Fraught and Fascinating Biology of Climate Change. Now, this book is all about how different species of flora and fauna are trying to or failing to um, adapt to uh, the warming climate, whether that's through um, migration, adaptation, or dying. It's kind of like the, uh, the MAD uh, oh, acronym. Uh, yeah, yeah, moving yeah adapting or dying uh anyways the book kind of deals a lot with the ones that are just acting like really weird for example plastic squid there are some humboldt squid in the pacific um that people kind of thought had either just sort of been extirpated or kind of went locally extinct and stuff uh that people used to fish for um, but it actually was determined after a while that they were just pressured so heavily um between uh, overfishing and then the climate change and everything like that, that their actual body size was like rapidly shrinking. So they were uh, uh, become maturing and becoming adults at like half the size they were <laughs> beforehand. And all the ones that they had been catching, they thought were like juveniles or like another species or something, they didn't even like recognize them. Um, but anyways, a lot of the book is dealing with uh, phenology, which is sort of the timing of different natural processes. And this is something you, you easily could do like at your in your own backyard and stuff in your own like local area. But for example, he, he kind of goes to Walden Pond with uh, Thoreau, uh, they uncovered some journals where he had basically written down the dates of all the different bloomings of different plants and flowers and stuff. Um, and they timed it with like local, <laughs> local records. Um, and it showed how like the plants were blooming essentially like, three weeks earlier than they used to be doing. Um, and I feel like a lot of us could probably say the same things if you kind of live in like any kind of green or live near a greenish space or have a nice backyard or anything like that. I feel like you could probably do something uh, similar as well. Uh, but yeah, it just kind of deals with, you know, what are the consequences of that? Um, and like some of the consequences, um, for example, like with migrating birds, since they're not dealing with temperature per se, they're dealing more with like uh, just the, you know, the length of the day, which doesn't, that's not impacted by uh, climate change or warming weather or anything like that. Uh, they kind of keep to the same old schedule, but if they miss like, you know, the insect populations that, uh, you know, that explode that they normally would feed to their chicks and stuff, you know, a lot of the birds go hungry, things like that. So it's a lot more complicated than what people kind of always uh, realize. But there's a couple different little little concepts like microrefugia that I really I learned about that I had never really heard of, um, which are like kind of like little like hyper local climates. Uh, that aren't affected by climate change effectively just because of like you know, their geologic conditions and stuff and they're able to have like species from like <laughs> like the past age and like the ice age and stuff it's very odd uh just but it's kind of like fun to learn about um but it was fun to learn also about like different species migration and how some species are able to adapt by like moving pretty quickly and how some uh either they don't have the capability of doing so or uh, like it's just physically impossible. For example, if you're on a mountain range, you know, to get to a cooler location, you have to just keep going up the mountain, but there's only so far you can go up the mountain <laughs> before the mountain ends. And the area, you know, as you keep going up, uh, kind of decreases just because of like the, you know, the pyramidal structure, conal structure of a mountain and stuff. Um, but anyways, it's kind of interesting how uh, different citizen science initiatives and stuff have been helping to kind of map out the different migratory patterns of like different birds with like the Audubon, like Christmas count, things like that. So yeah, this is kind of just a wide ranging uh, book dealing with all kinds of like stuff on phenology, 
um, adaptations to like a, a warming planet, stuff like that. So definitely encourage you to read it. And it's super readable. I love Thor Hansen. So this is my third, third or fourth book by him. Uh, I think out of like the five or six that he's written. So um, probably will end up reading his whole like bibliography at some point in time. But yeah, definitely check out Hurricane Lizards and Plastic Squid. So there you have it. Those are like my six favorite science-ish <laughs> books that I read so far this year. Let me know which one sounds like the one you would be most interested in. I mean, if you haven't read any, and if you have, let me know what your thoughts on these were as well. But whether you're reading science books or not, always remember, read victoriously.